So hello everyone and welcome to our session, uh, current ESG landscape in investor versus company perspective. My name is Carla Nunes. I am a managing director with Duff and Felt, a Kroll business. And uh, I've also just recently been uh, elected as a practitioner board uh, at uh, FMA International. So I'm really thrilled to be here um, today in this moderating this panel. Uh, I have about uh, 25 years of experience, mostly in uh, corporate valuation, uh, with some and uh, related to that financial reporting and tax uh, in, in how it impacts valuation. Uh, I have a dual role in my firm, one of them being in our global office of professional practice, where I, among other things, assist a global team uh, in the areas of, with questions in corporate um, firm valuation uh, and, and, and other related issues. And one of, one of the topics that has surfaced uh, since uh, early 2020, and it's getting more and more so in terms of volume of questions, is how would you go about incorporating ESG when valuing a firm or a project? And uh, so ESG meaning environmental, social, and governance issues. And uh, related to this, uh, one of the questions that often practitioners ask is, um, can I adjust my discount rate when I'm looking at, uh, you know, discounting the uh, projected cash flows into a present value term for the fact that a company may be, quote, bad or good ESG citizen. Uh, and so, uh, so even though I always, tell people to first focus on the cash flows, on the projected cash flows, discount rate is like a big deal for them. And so it is, um, my other role is actually in the area of cost of capital. And I lead our team that produces cost of capital data. And we're precisely looking at um, what are some of the things we can do to, um, to incorporate ESG uh, in, in cost of capital uh, decisions. And so it's, thrilling to me that we have today's panel uh, and that the topic we're going to address is is precisely around this area. So uh, we are joined today by Tim Kohler of McKinsey & Co. We have Lukasz Pormoski in um, AQR Capital Management and we have Luke Taylor at Wharton School. And I wanted to ask each one of them to introduce themselves first and give a little bit of a background on how they got to be involved with ESG issues, uh, as I think that will provide us with a little bit of context for the discussion today. So I'm gonna start with you, Tim. Can you give us a little bit about, uh, tell us about yourself? Thank you, Carla. Uh, it's nice to see all of you. Thank you for joining. I'm Tim Kohler. I'm a partner in McKinsey's uh, strategy and corporate finance practice. I've been with McKinsey for 35 years. Uh, I work across industries, across geographies, uh, and I focus my entire career on topics related to value creation, um, including uh, doing a lot of our research and uh, publishing, including um, I'm the lead author on our textbook called Valuation, Measuring and Managing the Value of Companies. Um, I got involved in ESG. I actually wrote my first article on this topic in the late 2000s, so probably over 13 or 14 years ago, when we were talking about co corporate social responsibility, which is sort of the same kind of thing, um, because of a colleague of mine uh, who was very interested in the topic, and 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 we sort of examined it. And um, you know, now that it's become much more topic, so I work on it because, quite frankly, our clients are asking about it. They're asking about how it affects my value. They're asking about reporting, those kind of things. Uh, so I'm pretty intrigued, and I, I and I have some views that may be heretical about it. Um, so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, Lucas, would you like to go next? Sure. And first of all, thank you very much for having me on the panel. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And much like Tim, I'm looking forward for uh, to, to the conversation, hopefully some healthy disagreement and debate as well. Uh, so as Carla said, I'm, uh, I work at AQR Capital Management. Uh, I'm the head of ESG research there. What it means is that in some shape or form, sort of any ESG projects, be it sort of alpha, 
type research or risk research or a product design, for example, or you know, thought pieces, you know, papers that we sometimes send to academic journals as well across my desk. Not to say that I work on all of that, that would be just too much for any one person to to do, but uh, I'm, I'm responsible for building an agenda around these projects, making sure that they're co correctly sort of prioritized, staffed, and so on. Uh, I, uh, to, the, to the question that you asked about why ESG, uh, it's, it's an interesting question because it's a, it's a sort of nexus of overlapping uh, incentives and interests. The simple answer is that it is something that uh, our clients increasingly care about and look to managers such as AQR for guidance and thought leadership on. So that's an easy one. The, you know, the full spectrum would also include the fact that you know, some of these questions are just genuinely interesting to, to, to a researcher. I, uh, prior to, to AQR, I, I, I've worked in academia, I've been in the central banks and such. But you know, ultimately, I, I try to find questions that give me sort of intellectual pleasure to investigate, and that there's certainly pleasure, but also a lot of challenge uh, in ESG, where many questions are difficult to address, many answers are actually conflicting with what the common sense, you know, might tell you initially, and hopefully we'll touch on some of these in this conversation. Uh, and you know, finally, there's a certain element of a of a mission, if you will, as well, where you know, I believe that some of the questions we're dealing with that our clients, for example are increasingly interested in uh, go beyond the standard metrics of risk and return. People are asking questions about, you know, impact about changing the real economy, for example, through your financial portfolio. So there's an element to, to sort of almost a mission to it as well. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, Luke. Okay. Thanks, Carla. I uh, really appreciate this opportunity. I'm looking forward to learning from you, Tim, Tim and Lukash. Uh, I'm a finance professor at Wharton. I've been on the faculty here for, for roughly 13 years. And I have to say, I'm humbled to be, to be on this panel because I'm, I'm teaching out of Tim's famous valuation textbook in five, five days from today. Um, also, back when I was a, a graduate student at the University of Chicago, Lukasz Pomorski was an older PhD student in the program. He was someone I always looked up to, and I, I still look up, look up to him. Lukash was also one of my very best teachers that I had in, in grad school. Um, so why ESG? Well, I, I've been doing research on the asset management industry for, for many years. Uh, roughly two years ago, we, uh, I, I made a strong pivot in my research toward thinking about sustainable finance. And, and I, we did that with, with my, my, my co-authors mainly because we saw this dramatic increase in, in interest in the topic. And we knew that this was gonna be an important, um, an important topic that we just, we all need to understand better. Thanks. All right, well, thank you. So, uh, I mean, actually uh, that is uh, very uh, conducive to, to, to start our, our discussion. So. Uh, I actually looked at a, uh, a report that was published in July of, of this year, and it was by this organization called the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance. And what they documented was the rise of investments that are labeled as ESG, and that of course can mean a lot of things, uh, between 2016 and by the end of 2020. And um, globally, uh, assets that were labeled as sustainable investing, uh, grew from about 22 trillion US dollars, that's trillion with a T, in 2016 to over 35 trillion in 2020. That's about a 55% rise in four years. Uh, in 2016, more than half of those were located in Europe, whereas it, by 2020, about roughly half is actually in the US. Uh, and another important aspect is that the share of assets under management um, globally that are attributable to sustainable investments, they documented that they rose from about 28% in 2016 to 36% um, in 2020. So clearly it's like a really rising interest, not just in words, but also in actions in terms of, of directing investment investment um, mandates and uh, and portfolios around the globe are incorporating these these um, these ESG uh, related uh, investments. So the first question I'm actually going to start with you Luke and and, and it's about um, 
equity returns that we can see uh, from, you know, from an investor versus a corporate perspective, but the equity returns, the academic evidence, um, I think it's mixed. In other words, that uh, some, um, some academic studies will say that, um, that you have a higher performance if you invest in ESG, others will say the opposite. So I wanted to ask you about your own research and what have you found like about past performance of ESG investments, how have they performed? And uh, if anything, what was the source of, of that uh, ESG performance? Yeah, sure, that's a, it's a great question. And I, I agree with your, your characterization of the academic literature on this topic. Uh, some studies find that ESG strategies have performed really well and others find the opposite. So we wanted to, to look in the, into this, and I, I should give credit to my co-authors as well, Lubosh Pastor and Rob Stambaugh on this study. We, um, we wanted to, to look at how a, a very specific ESG investment strategy has performed recently. And this is an investment strategy that essentially involves going long, I'll call them green stocks, I mean, environmentally friendly stocks, and shorting environmentally unfriendly stocks I'll call those brown stocks. So first of all, how do we measure this? Um, we use data from uh, the MSCI ESG ratings database, and we're focusing in on their, their, their variables that measure environmental performance of companies. And, and we just measure you know, how environmentally friendly is each company. We kind of back test the strategy, going long green, going short brown, and what we find is that green stocks have massively outperformed brown over the last eight or, or nine years. So if you look at a portfolio that's long green and short brown, that portfolio has an average return of roughly half a percent per year uh, over the course of eight or nine years. So I, if you had kind of invested a dollar eight or nine years ago, um, uh, the strategy would have given you a return of around 170 percentage points, which is, which is a lot. So bottom line, we're finding that this specific ESG strategy has performed incredibly well. And then we ask, well, why? Um, did, it, did it perform well because we expected it to perform well, or did it just get lucky? And our answer is that uh, it was mainly luck. Uh, uh, the performance was unexpected. And, and we kind of traced the, this incredible performance to um, changes and concerns about climate change. One thing that's been very special about the last eight or so years is that we've all become much more concerned about climate change. And this is something we measure. We, we measure an index of how concerned are people about climate change it's an index based on having basically having a computer go out and read, you know, the eight, uh, every news story in the eight biggest newspapers. And you can measure, you know, you can see in the data, okay, people are becoming more and more concerned about climate change. The next thing we do is we show that this uh, investment strategy performs really well exactly in those months when people became most concerned about climate change. So green stocks outperform when we all get more concerned about environmental issues. And, uh, and we find that that's actually been the main source of this outperformance in the sense that if you were to go in the data and zero out those, climate, uh, those changes in climate concerns, um, the strategy's outperformance completely disappears. That's to say, if we counterfactually had not become more concerned about climate change, Green stocks would not have outperformed. So that's the sense in which we find that green stocks performed well because they got lucky in the kind of macabre sense that, well, we got really bad news about climate change recently. That, that's excellent. And just to touch a little bit upon your research as well. So obviously the biggest focus is on equities. Uh, have you looked at anything related to debt as well? I think there was something on sovereign debt. Yeah, absolutely. There's a nice case study you can use to think about, you know, how have green assets performed? Did they perform well because of luck or did they perform well because we expected them? And the case study is about um, German sovereign debt. The German government performed kind of a useful experiment to us as researchers. They recently issued uh, green bonds. And for each of these green bonds, there was a non-green twin. So these are both German sovereign bonds 
And what's really useful to us is that the, these bonds have exactly the I'm same cash flow. Right they have exactly the same cash flows. The only difference is that one bond is green and the other is not green. And similarly, we find that the green bond has performed very well. It outperformed its non-green twin. So it's another example of a green asset having high realized returns. Was that expected or did it get lucky? Well, the useful thing about bonds is that you can observe their expected returns through their yields. And what's interesting is that the green bond at every single point in time, the green bond was expected to underperform its twin, yet it outperformed. So it's a useful example of how green assets can have lower expected returns, yet higher realized returns. And of course, what's the wedge between an expected return and a realized return? Well, the wedge is unexpected shocks, or if you like, you just call it luck. The green bonds got lucky. That's excellent. Um, Lucas, I was actually going to ask you, because you, because you also did some research at AQR uh, in this topic, and uh, I think it's uh, from an equity perspective, uh, equity returns perspective and, and risk. And so uh, what, your, what, what are your views based on your research on this um, underperformance versus overperformance of, of, of green stocks or just in general ESG positive, uh, highly rated um, stocks versus others? Sure. So, uh, so I guess the key question is uh, why do investors investors care about these quantities you know is this is this a preference that is maybe non-monetary is this is taste you know maybe along the lines of the French 2007 you know taste and disagreement about you know how attractive a given security is is this a view uh, that uh, is more risk-based you know so as Luke mentioned you know to the extent that we uh, we receive shocks you know meaning new information that changed our minds about how uh, severe let's say climate risks maybe on a going forward basis if we change our our views about the probability of you know policy action for example around climate and so on uh, is this you know why people are increasingly interested in uh, looking at at uh, green versus brown stocks just to use uh, looks uh, terminology uh, or finally is this is this basically a, uh, an attempt to uh, earn higher returns is this a, a you know inactive uh, management you know do you do you create a portfolio that is uh, different from the overall benchmark for example with a goal of identifying those uh, securities that for whatever reason that maybe due to cash flow maybe due to sort of news coming in that you have a, uh, an insight about uh, is designed to outperform the, the, the benchmarks. And I, I think the answers actually will be somewhat different uh, in terms of uh, dynamics of how prices develop. But what is common is that uh, whenever you have those uh, shifts in investor demands, you know, the, the prices will adjust. So whether you talk about the larger set of investors now uh, changing their taste, for example, for whatever reason, they are uh, less uh, enticed by brown securities out there and they change their allocations correspondingly. Whether you talk about risk and the repricing that is driven by discount rate channel because some of the securities out there are riskier than we had thought they were, they, uh, or, or you know, whether there's an, uh, sort of an active shift you know, that uh, some investors think they have more information, for, uh, for example, you will just see this uh, eventually reflect in prices. And to, to Luke's point, you know, this is the repricing that, that may have, in my view, sort of uh, is responsible for at least, uh, at least a portion of that uh, green versus brown outperformance that we've seen over the last you know, 10 or so years. Um, that's hopefully clear. Uh, what is interesting is also what happens afterwards. And what happens afterwards will depend somewhat on your on your assumptions. But generally, again, the common part of many of these of these uh, theories, you know, ours, you know, when, uh, in, in the paper that uh, we have last better essential shorted skibbons, for example, in Lux, but also in many other theory papers that have the same general structure uh, in how we think about ESG. Well, what happens later is uh, generally lower returns. We have lower returns that could be what people usually refer to as a sin premium. So this is the first you know, category that I mentioned, the taste-based uh, discrimination of some stocks versus, versus others. If you have a, a swath of the market that is not willing to hold brown securities, then eventually prices will adjust and effectively the price today will drop. So that's the repricing part to entice the rest of the market to, to buy the brown stocks from whoever wants to sell them. 
but on a going forward basis, assuming that the cash flows of these stocks are not affected, you know, these stocks will deliver higher returns and you can view this as a compensation for, you know, maybe holding your nose if you're one of the investors who are willing to uh, now buy these stocks. If you if you are a fan of a risk story, then uh, again, the pattern will be similar. You uh, uh, reprice these stocks based on risk exposure. So on a going forward basis, if those risks are systematic, you actually would expect to earn some compensation for holding those going forward. Uh, finally, maybe this is the only sort of differentiated story in terms of predictions on a going forward basis. If your view is much more of that there's a mispricing that was uh, eliminated, you know, I would at least acknowledge that there's a possibility that, that the future prices are basically very similar for ground and for, for pre, pre net from brown and green stocks, simply because what we saw in the past was maybe some distortion in the market that was uh, that was uh, uh, removed by the actions of arbitrageurs. And, and Lucas, that, that's actually um, very, very interesting in a sense that one of the things that I think, at least from a practitioner standpoint, people really forget that risk uh, return relationship. And if something is expected to be riskier, say that their brown stocks are riskier because of regulatory, uh, regulatory um, you know, uh, new restrictions and you know, carbon pricing and all these other things, that if they're riskier, then you would expect them to get a higher return in the future, like just from an expectation standpoint. Uh, do, do you agree? <laughs> Depends on the risk, right? I mean, if that risk can be diversified right. away, then maybe not necessarily. Uh, if that risk is more systematic, then then probably. I mean, it's it, it depends on on can you diversify the risk, and also depends on how costly this risk is to, is to people. And there are certain risks that don't warrant the price because uh, people just don't. I mean, they are willing to hold them, and they those risks are not in the context of economic theories. They don't correlate with marginal utility in a way that would. Uh, if it would uh, cause you to demand the price, meaning that bad outcomes in terms of exposures don't necessarily coincide with bad outcomes in the economy, for example. So if you have some risks that you know only materialize when the economy is doing really well and you know all other stocks are doing very well, then maybe that stock that such a risk doesn't deserve a price. So apologies for giving you a sort of a more convoluted answer, but you know, but it's it's not enough that there is a risk. You know, it's it's also a question of what type of risk this is. Most people would agree that you know with climate at least has a potential at least of being systematic, but you know I have yet to see a sort of convincing sort of proof of I, I believe so as well, but you know but it's very difficult to sort of build a sort of fully coherent, you know, set of silver bullet type of evidence. Other ESG type risks may not actually be very, uh, may, may be material for individual companies, but they may, may not be systematic enough to deserve a systematic reward. Okay, that's great. Actually, I, I'm going to segue that to Tim because Tim would bring us more like a, a corporate perspective because obviously from an investor perspective, it's you want to maximize returns for a given level of risk. Uh, and, uh, but from a corporation standpoint, it's actually probably the other way around. You're thinking like, can I issue either equity or debt uh, at a lower cost, right? So the cost of attracting funds that might cost the capital, uh, would it be uh, you know, lower, for example, if I were to focus on some of these issues? And uh, there was a, um, a recent study by MSCI uh, where they use their MSCI ratings to, to show in their um, MSCI world versus, um, uh, versus emerging markets that they found that in general, companies that were rated um, with a higher score, yes, meaning like it's a better score uh, from an ESG perspective that they did it have a lower cost of capital and uh and and vice versa and so it this seems to be across the various regions seem to hold uh for the most part so i wanted to ask him like from your perspective uh do companies that come for uh advice to you do they talk about you know shareholder returns what they're you know they want to achieve with the sg investments or are they, they just fo focus on creating value in general and, and like cash flow initiative type and, and not so much worried about cost of capital issues? Um, thank you. Um, I, I, yes, the, our, our companies that we talk to are asking the question about cost of capital. Um, uh, we try to get them to focus on the cash flows, not the cost of capital. 
Um, and the reason for that with respect to anything, including ESG, right? Um, you know, you, you can imagine a situation where you've got two oil companies, one of them, you know, and there a lot of the oil companies are talking about transitioning at the energy transition and shifting towards more renewables, et cetera. Um, but you can easily imagine a situation where um, one company, um, you know, innovates and comes up with some new approach to renewable, some new technology that's proprietary that allows them to create a lot of value. And another, another company simply buys wind farms, okay? Um, and in those kind of situations, which company is gonna create more value, right? Is more likely the company that's innovating as opposed to the company that's maybe making the equal shift and maybe getting an equal ESG benefit and, 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 and buying wind farms, which are generic or which are commodities, right? And so they can't really create any additional value there. So I think that the whole, there's a whole big issue of measurement here, right? Um, and that, 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 that I don't think we've, we've cracked. And I think we're too early to, uh, to, to, to really be able to solve this problem. Uh, because we do know, for example, that different of the rating agencies who provide ESG scores come up with different rankings and ratings for different companies, right? Um, based on some arbitrary factors sometimes. Uh, so, so it is an issue. Um, and it's also a challenge in the sense that, uh, you know, the academic, you know, MSCI maybe come out with one way. I've seen a recent study from the West Coast that came out and said, no, there is no difference in cost of capital. Um, uh, uh, you know, and, and then the question is, is if, if two companies are valued differently, is that because they have different cost of capital? or because they have different expected cash flows. Our bias is towards saying they have different expected cash flows, right? The reason oil and gas companies have such low valuations right now is because they have low expected cash flows, right? Um, not necessarily because they have a higher cost of capital. And by the way, going to what Luke was, Luke was talking about, the difference between realized returns and expected returns, right? And we get into this challenge also where you can't have a situation where investors can say, um, you know, you, you, you know, if you're marketing a fund, you can't say to investors, well, ESG funds are going to outperform at the same time telling a company that's going to have a lower cost of capital. Those are contradictory statements, right? So even if there's a one-time shift and, and, and then for a short period of time, uh, investors outperform in the long term if the cost of cost of capital is lower then ESG investors will earn lower returns than other investors which will then cause some of those investors to question whether they should be doing it or not pension funds have fiduciary responsibilities and other things like that um, towards their members right not just um, uh, with regard to ESG so so I hope I'm trying to convey here is this issue is so complicated. Um, our advice to clients is first, don't worry about ratings because the ratings are somewhat arbitrary, it's sort of like the college rankings, right? You know, co colleges do all kinds of things to manipulate the rankings, right? Um, uh, and that's fairly easy to do. So you can manipulate the rankings. What matters to, what we've done is we talk to sophisticated investors, right? These are, these are the, Wellingtons, the, Do the Dodge and Coxes, who really, you know, dig deep. And what they're most interested in is what is the company doing not only to minimize the, the negative side of ESG, particularly if they're, you know, in, an, in a business that pollutes a lot, uh, but also, you know, are their investments going to create value or not? And so they're primarily focused on the cash flows and trying to get a sense of, you know, measurement as to whether the cost of, you know, I, I guess our belief is the cost of capital is very difficult to measure, particularly the cost of equity, right? So it'd be very difficult to sort of prove that the cost of capital is, you know, two tenths of a point higher or lower, right? That's just within the range of, 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 uh, of, of, of statistical error, right? And I've seen a lot of the stuff on green bonds. One, of the, one big company issued a green bond recently and they claimed they, 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 they saved a tenth of a, 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 a or a 10 basis points, right? Once again, how do you even measure 10 basis points? Bond prices fluctuate during the course of the day by that much, right? 
Uh, and of course, a banker is going to tell them that they're saving 10 basis points because that's their job, right? So I think trying to build this into the cost of capital is, is very difficult. And, and, and so, for, so I think I, our advice to clients is to focus on the cash flows. We still think that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there to create value. We think there are things you can do to generate more revenues by doing things that are more ESG rent or oriented. Customers will pay more for certain brand, for certain products that have you know, better ESG type of thing. Um, uh, you know, certain investments in new areas will pay off certain ones. Focus on things that will make a difference. If I'm a beverage company, focus on water consumption. If I'm a uh, clothing company, focus on the supply chain and whether there are human rights violations. Those are the things that companies should be doing if they really want to maximize value and not worrying so much about the ratings per se. Figure out what matters to you as a company, your company, your industry, and work on those things. Okay, that's excellent, Tim, uh, which actually uh, brings me to, um, you know, related to that issue. So the, the ratings indeed have um, proliferated and uh, from different uh, parts, and uh, it seems that they will reach different conclusions. And if you look at recent performance, depending on the rating and you associate bad versus good, you might get a different answer depending on who issues those ratings. But it does seem that MSCI has emerged a little bit as the leader of the pack. And um, so, Luke, I wanted to give you a little bit of an opportunity also to talk about, you know, you were talking about, um, you know, uh, past performance versus what you could expect in the future, future performance, and which, which um, Tim was just also talking about. But um, does it matter that we're using these uh, ratings as a way of measurement? I mean, it, it is, we need something to measure, right, performance uh, and connect it with a factor. Uh, but uh, it is, you know, does it matter or not? And what do you think in terms of expected returns should we think about? And I would say one more thing about both debt and equity that Tim was just saying, uh, there's an, a certain element, even for example, the sovereign bonds for Germany, this is also a certain element of scarcity. In other words, uh, what happens when uh, there's tons of investments out there that really are true, like green assets or green investments or positive ESG, et cetera, that maybe then this, uh, you know, drive to invest in something that is labeled as such will not be as important in the future because you could have like a premium for example in in debt you could have a lower cost of debt and i and i agree 10 basis points is irrelevant in in some ways uh, in the scheme of in the overall scheme of things but is it also because there's not enough out there to satisfy the demand that investors right now have for um for for quote, green investments, is that going to, going to go away in the future and that will impact returns? Yeah, good, great questions. Um, before I jump in, I agree about the how small these so-called greeniums are. When we look at the German twin bonds, the, 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 the yield spread between the green bond and its twin is on the order of like five basis points. It's, it's, it's there. You can measure it, but it, it is, I agree, it's very small. Um, yeah, let me start, Carla, with your, your questions on measurement. How do we measure a company's ESG characteristics? I think this is one of the huge, to use Tim's word, uncracked um, issues out there. I think it's, it is a first order importance. Um, maybe one way to interpret your question, Carla, is like, does it matter which set of ratings you use? Absolutely. Um, uh, I'll, uh, these ratings providers are offering differentiated products. I think I'm stealing, that's an idea that Lukash gave me in the past. Like they are providing a differentiated product. They're not trying to sell exactly the same ratings because then they wouldn't have a valuable ratings business. Um, I, I've learned one thing. One of the most useful things I've learned about the ESG raters is when you're starting to do research using a given set of ratings, the first question you need to answer is, is this ratings provider benchmarking the ratings by industry? I found that several ratings providers are giving you ESG ratings that are industry adjusted. 
other providers are not industry adjusting uh, their ratings. And this makes a huge difference. For example, if you're using a rater that provides industry adjusted ratings, they could say, here's a coal company that looks very green simply because it's a little bit cleaner than the other coal companies out there. Conversely, they'll say, here's a solar energy company that's actually quite brown, just because it's a little dirtier than other solar companies. So the first thing you have to figure out is, are these ratings industry adjusted or not? You know, I think specific to MSCI, their, their, their letter score, their, under, their overall grade is an industry adjusted measure. But the, I think the real reason the MSCI data are so useful is they have more granular data variables that are not industry adjusted. So which should you use, an, an adjusted measure or not? I think the answer is we don't know. We, you know we, we don't know what investors care about. If you're an ESG investor, do you care about a company's ESG performance relative to their peers or not? I think that's an, a really important, outstanding um, research question. In our study, we use um, ratings variables that are not adjusted because we think it makes sense to say, look, the typical coal company is much dirtier than the typical solar company. So we should use ratings that are not uh, sector or industry adjusted. And we find that that really matters. When I said that, you know, green stocks have outperformed recently, to reach that, that result, it's crucial to use ratings that are not industry adjusted. Basically, our result is very much driven by um, green industries have outperformed dirty industries. When you look a little bit closer and you could ask, well, is there a within industry effect? Within an industry, have greener companies outperformed? The answer is, yeah, a little bit, but it's like barely there. The main effect is comparing across, across industries. Uh, I think I've answered only a tiny portion of your questions, Carla, but I don't wanna take up too much, uh, too much air in the discussion. Well, that's that's actually excellent because it it is interesting that in practice I uh, you know I, I was talking with a few different um, ESG rating um, companies uh, to understand their methodology a little and how they ranked and I was indeed surprised that the rankings were um, you know relative to uh, to each other in, within the same industry and so when I asked so does that mean if a company gets acquired or IPOs and suddenly gets put into this industry mix, does that mean that the position of the, rate of the other companies will change? And the answer was yes, which I was a little bit surprised in a sense that uh, when we talk about, for example, uh, sovereign or debt ratings in general, if we talk about S&P and, MS uh, and uh, Moody's and Fitch, for example, it's an absolute measure. A AAA rated company, which there are almost none in the world, is a AAA rated company regardless of which industry you're in. Other than, you know, of course, there could be industry value drivers that make you be more or less likely to fulfill your debt obligations. But so I was surprised about that. And I think that causes um, a bit of a, 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 you know, a challenge for in terms of measurement uh, and the other for, for research and for practical uh, purposes. And the other aspect I had found surprising in, in one of them um, you know, which I think they're, they're changing their methodology, but one of them that I had talked to of the MSP, uh, of the ratings types, uh, they were also giving um, a lot more weight to whether or not a survey had been fulfilled on ESG questions. And so if you hadn't answered the survey, you had a much uh, worse rating, which again, I, you know, it shouldn't be a function of how much information you filled out. It should be a function of, um, you know, what's available out there and what's being disclosed. So uh, I'm actually going to ask Lukash, um, you know, when you were doing your own research, uh, I mean, I think you also used MSCI uh, and was it overall MSCI um, ratings, um, uh, you know, overall score or were you grappling with some of these issues as well and in just in terms of measurements uh, and trying to find, you know, what is systematic versus not systematic in this area. Um, what were some of the challenges uh, in your research? Sure. So, uh, you know, first of all, if you take a step back, I mean, uh, there is this, uh, in my view, unfortunate perception that uh, 
you know, the EEG ratings uh, game is a free for all, and you know, who knows how these are computed. I, I, I actually have a probably a minority <laughs> point of view here that uh, it's a, it's a, it's a very complex, very difficult uh, process they're trying to, uh, those in data providers are trying to build. Uh, the process where many stakeholders will have different views of different needs. So it's, you know, some people will, some investors, some users of those ratings will actually put, put emphasis on different different parts of the process. I mean, some of the things that we discussed here are actually, uh, will have different answers depending on, on, on your use case, you know. So for example, to the question of, should you adjust for uh, peers uh, versus not, you know, let me give you two examples. You know, one is that uh, there's nobody that I'm aware of who would think about carbon emissions in a way that is adjusted for sector. Right, it's a, it wouldn't make sense, you know. It's a, of course, there's a tremendous uh, relationship between how much uh, greenhouse gas uh, a company emits into the atmosphere and where the company sits. Is it a, a utility, is it an IT company, for example? Uh, and you know, because people care about this underlying metric of carbon emissions, but they just don't don't adjust. Uh, there's other metrics, however, where this adjustment, in my view, is is actually quite. Uh, sensible, you know. So, for example, you know, one of the metrics of um, uh, sort of social, maybe uh, type dimensions of the company is how companies treat the employees. How would you measure this? You could you could use you know in data such as uh, number of uh, accidents in the workplace, you know, number of uh, uh, people who suffer work-related injuries. But if you did this with, without adjusting for uh, for for the, for the sector, then you would be sort of very biased towards those companies that are sort of white collar companies, perhaps with smaller labor forces. You know, if you compare it to construction and such, you know, it's a. I mean, again, depends on what you want. If you want, you want if you want your portfolio to be very to have very low exposure to companies where there are accidents in the workplace, fine. You will run a sector fund that only looks at a couple of sectors. But I think it's, it would be missing the point if you said that you know that company that has a high incidence of uh, uh, accidents simply because this is the industry that, that the company is in, and maybe the company is actually brilliant compared to its peers. You're actually missing something really important if you don't don't allow for this. Uh, so again, if you, if you bring some data to this, you know it's the, the concept of the diversity of uh, views there. You know, I think is driven by the marketplace, by different people need different things. But it's also, in my minority, you know, very comforting that the correlations between these metrics are actually quite high. You know, you know it's super easy to find you know examples of a company that is uh, the worst of the worst. You know, according to one data provider, it's neutral. According to another, and it's best in class. According to the third. But it's an anecdote. If you look at the correlation, sort of pairwise correlation. So if you do this uh, simple exercise, uh, randomly select two uh, easy data providers and then look at the correlation uh, of our scores across individual companies, the correlation on average is about 0.5, so 50%. It's not 0.99. It's not 0.99 because for the reasons that I mentioned, this is not you know, as easy, if you, if you forgive me saying this, as uh, talking about uh, credit ratings where we have a very very clear uh, objective what we're trying to measure. This is much more nebulous, and even in that context, you know, you actually have a, have a decently positive correlation between these providers. So, so I'm, I'm actually, if anything, I'm surprised because I, I've talked to a number of these providers, and I'm surprised how how high that correlation is. And I have certain uh, suspicions that you know, but in some cases, the correlation actually is uh, is driven by things that are. By, 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 by structural issues, for example, some data is going to be incredibly difficult to find, you know, so, for, so that correlation is going to be higher for environmental type exposures, for example, where my suspicion is that, you know, we all look at the same kind of data and not surprisingly our, under, our, our, our scores tend to be more correlated when it comes to governance, which is uh, something that uh, academia has been studying for multiple decades. We have so many different pieces of data or ideas that we could measure, but the correlations are going to be higher, sorry, lower for governance simply because people have more, more freedom to select, you know, different, different bits that they believe are more material, more meaningful for our underlying objective. So I'll pause here, but, you know, but I, 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 I do believe that there is this interesting sort of uh, difference in opinion about, you know, how much these ratings are really worth. I haven't even commented on that, by the way. I, I think it's a, it's a, there's use cases, there's clear, but, you know, these are very heavily used. We haven't even gotten the question, what can these predict, which is a different question. My, my point is only that uh, the complaint that all these ratings are so different and the processes are different, you know, is somewhat misplaced in my view.
That's, I mean, that's a great point, and and it's good to have the the different views in the panel, uh, and and just give us this, something to think about. Uh, and so, yeah, the question is, uh, is there any predictive power by using some of these ways to measure things uh, versus um, versus an alternative? Because the what I have found, and we can talk about this a little later, is that it's really hard. There's so much information out there, and some of it is actually not relevant. And even just looking at a filing of a company to see what kinds of risks the company is exposed to, I feel like I'm reading like a, a legal contract uh, or document with lawyers speak about, I'm exposed to all these risks, and it's like a, an array of risks, and I, I have a hard time thinking, how do I convert those things in those disclosures into an actual um, you know, measure. Uh, and so, uh, you know, these BSG ratings for now are probably filling up a role of that, you know, of all this information overload that we can't find a, a common metric by which to measure a uh, company's performance in, in some areas. So, um, so that's great. Uh, Tim, and, and I was just going to talk a little bit about from the perspective of a firm and from, um, you know, the fact that we're talking about increasing now the focus of not just being a, a shareholder centric, but now that we're actually thinking about, um, you know, stakeholder capitalism. In other words, we do care about, or at least it seems like the world is moving towards that, that we don't just care about, um, you know, shareholders maximizing returns for shareholders, but also taking into consideration you know, employees, customers, uh, you know, and, and that whole supply chain. And so what are the implications from a, 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 you know, a value creation standpoint? And I'm sure you're going to say something about it depends, but, uh, you know, uh, are we in general for the shareholders, are we thinking that this expansion of the mandate will lower their returns in the future because um, you have to accommodate uh, uh, not just purely profit maximizing, but all these other initiatives to, um, um, you know, to, to be part of managing a business. Yeah, um, uh, I think you have to start with the question of what do you mean by maximizing shareholder value, right? Um, do you talk about maximizing shareholder value in the next six months or the next year? Uh, or you talk about maximizing shareholder value over the next five years. And I think you'll get a different answer. And I think that's part of the issue. A lot of the criticism and a lot of the conflicts between stakeholders occur if you have a very short-term lens on shareholder value creation, right? Any comp you know, companies can easily pump, pump up their profits in the near term. If I'm the CEO with one year to go in my tenure, I can just slash costs, do everything I can to make the company look good, get the share price up. Investors won't really know what's going on for a while, right? Um, and who cares about my customers, right? Um, so that can happen, right? Um, our point of view, though, is that if you think about shareholder value, you know, and, and our, our research suggests that 75% of a typical company shareholders are longer term oriented, right? They're not the traders moving in and out on a quarterly or daily basis, right? So 75%, if you add up retail investors, hedge funds, and all the institutional investors that have long holding periods, right? They are much more concerned about long-term shareholder value creation. And I think when you take that lens, it becomes less of a conflict between those different groups, right? There are rare situations, and I can point to many more situations where companies have done things to um, make their profits look better in the short term that have destroyed value in the long term because it turned off their customers. Okay. There was a luxury goods maker that I can, that I'm, I'm not going to name the name of. Um, you know, they started outsourcing production to Asia. The quality went down. They started to, and, and so, um, uh, discount a lot more and they scared away their core customers. Right. So for the first two or three years, you know, everybody thought they were fantastic because their profits were booming, right? Five years later, six years later, their profits are collapsing because, you know, they're selling 70% of their goods at discounts 
through 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 uh, through uh, discounters and stuff like that, and they've lost their core market, right? So they destroyed the company in the in in the pursuit of short term profits. And you can find lots of examples of companies that have that have done that, right? Because eventually, if you if you don't make your customers happy, right, you will lose market share almost always. It may take five years before customers realize and customers make the switch, but it will happen, right? Similarly with employees, if you, if you have employees who are not happy, it will affect the business. It will affect your turnover. Um, many of you are in the base in the US, you know, um, I like to go shopping where employees are happy. I like, I'd rather go to Trader Joe's than most typical grocery stores, right? Because the, the, the people who I'm dealing with are very happy, right? It really helps their business. Uh, so I do think that some of this conflict is overblown, right? Uh, but at the same time, there are decisions that have to be made, right? If that, that may, where there may be a conflict where both people could be happy, right? Let's assume that I am, you know, uh, a company that has a very popular consumer product. I have to decide, okay, should I, how, how high should I price that product, right? Um, you know, the consumers are already paying me a premium. I've got a 30% profit margin. Of course, I could make them happier if I reduce my profit margin, but maybe, but they're already very happy. So I'm not doing anything, you know, I, you know, saying we have to balance share different stakeholders doesn't give me any guidance as to how to make that balance when all the groups are already happy, right? If I have happy employees, happy customers, uh, and happy shareholders, and I've got an idea, what should I do? Who should benefit? You know, the, the, the only answer I think is the shareholders because that's where you have a fiduciary obligation, right? If it doesn't affect the other party. And these questions are also very difficult, even in the context of like say a coal company, right? A coal company has a lot of complex issues to deal with, right? If I, you know, and, and, and it's about all the, all the different constituents. Yes, I could shut down a coal mine today in West Virginia. If I shut that down the coal mine, I'm going to damage my shareholders. I'm going to damage the local community. A lot of people are going to be out of work, right? And I actually might damage the environment because someone else is going to be making that coal and maybe importing it to the U.S. where it's going to be used in coal-fired plants, right? And where it actually may have been produced and transported and generated more emissions. Uh, so these are very complex questions, but that's why I always go back to the question of, um, you know, if I take a long horizon view of shareholders, um, I usually find that there aren't as many contradictions or con conflicts between the different stakeholders over the long term than there are in the short term. Uh, and I guess it also depends, Lukas, uh, you know, I know we, mentioned, we talked about this a little bit. It also depends about... Um, you know, the environment, environment, and I don't mean environment like as in green, but like the background of um, will you exist as a firm, for example, if you don't make certain adjustments, uh, in that case, you are creating value. Uh, so you may not, because of regulation or whatever, you may not have a business to begin with if you don't adjust for this. Uh, or, um, or in other cases, it could be that it is more costly to provide certain goods uh, using certain production factors to to customers. So, for, uh, can you give us a little bit of your perspective on the stakeholder versus shareholder, and um, you know who is benefiting in, in terms of the, the what we can expect from a return standpoint? So, you know, for better or worse, I we may not get much of a debate here. I I I, I agree with everything that Tim said. You know, it's a, you know if you if you actually go back to the kind of the seminal text that people often refer to, but not always read. You know, to Milton Friedman's you know the, uh, uh, sort of proclamation of uh, shareholder value maximization. Uh, if you if you if you actually read or if you listen to some interviews of Friedman, you know, he actually made the point that Tim has made uh, as well. Uh, very often those uh, kind of pro-ESG, I can call them by any, any, any name, you know, CSR or anything else, these are actually uh, value maximizing uh, decisions by just about any measure. And, you know, the fact that uh, you wanted your 
your employees to be happy, for example, you know, there's, there's a lot of research, you know, not just in finance, but, you know, across other fields as well, that shows that, you know, that's actually a good thing for the company. Happy employees tend to be, to, to be an asset that, you know, that, are, that is maybe more productive. Maybe, maybe even you don't need to pay them as much as others uh, who are providing less happy work environments. Uh, kind of obvious to, uh, that, that happy uh, customers are an, are an important uh, consideration here. If you, uh, you know, if you, it doesn't need to be even, even directly related to your product. It's, you know, they made a great point about that. If you lower the quality of a product by cutting costs, you know, your customers will eventually find that out, but it, it, it's more, I mean, it's, there's an increasing, if you, if you go to a, to a store nowadays, there, you, you will probably notice that some labels that say that, you know, this product was uh, built without uh, an undue harm on the environment, for example, low carbon and such. It's not necessarily that the product is suffers of higher quality. It may or may not be, but that's not the point. The point is that uh, consumers increasingly put a premium on being able to, to purchase products, use products that are uh, produced uh, in a way that is aligned with their views. And it's a simple profit maximizing, shareholder value maximizing proposition for the company to actually think about this. And to the extent that it's, uh, that inc increases profits, you know, they don't care about the ESG, they don't probably even use that word. They try to maximize the well being of the company and, uh, and the shareholders. So, there's, there's no, uh, I don't think there's any, there's, I don't think there shouldn't be any, there should be any, any discussion on, on that point uh, where people disagree. And I probably will be again in, so Tim hasn't talked about this, uh, but I probably would be in his camp as well. Is what happens if you go beyond this? What happens if you actually try to divert pro, uh, from profitable uh, uh, opportunities to pursue other goals that may not be statutory goals you know, of, a, of, a, of an organization. Uh, so this is something that is deeply troubling to me because there's a conflict between what you want as a partial owner of a company, for example, and what that company should actually be doing. So one of the things that I'm very uneasy about is uh, engagement activities where uh, shareholders will uh, aggressively lobby for the company to stop doing X or start doing Y. And I'm uneasy about this because almost always, not always, perhaps, but almost always, the company has a lot more information about the underlying value of its projects. So how can you be sure as a, as a, as a shareholder that what you're actually lobbying for is not a, sort of removing a positive NPV project or, you know, forcing the company to, to take a, to take on a negative NPV project in the pursuit of what you care about, but, you know, what may not even be a necessarily uh, aligned with, uh, let's say, the, the, the customers of the company, just to make one example. So, you know, in terms of uh, the dialogue with companies, sort of where people like, uh, um, investors uh, step in and where I think, you know, they actually have a lot of uh, ammunition is engaging on transparency type questions, you know, asking companies to provide more information. So uh, let me look it back to, 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 to climate, you know, sort of asking company, uh, what is your uh, climate exposure? That may be a material uh, information for many investors, you know, so I, I'm, I'm much more comfortable with this sort of uh, uh, engagement that I'm an underlying company. And by the way, I don't presume that companies must at all costs uh, respond to these questions. There's always a trade-off, you know, that, that company may not be able to very cheaply produce that information, for example, we need to hire consultants and whatnot to do this. That company may be revealing some sort of proprietary information if they, uh, if they give people enough details to actually sort of uh, arrive at the metrics we, we, we care about. So I'm not going to presume that, that everybody should uh, report, but, you know, but I think there's a great question. Why aren't you reporting when your peers are reporting, for example? Uh, and that's an excellent point in terms of like as more information comes in and uh, people start incorporating some of that information in you know, for example, ESG ratings or uh, or some other measures of, of um, it is does it have from a research standpoint, Luke, you think it has a, a potential to distorting comp comparisons over time? So because perhaps like methodologies in how the data is uh, compiled uh, and it doesn't get backfilled, right? Um, are we going to be looking in the future if, as people do more research in this area, can it be probably distorting trends uh, of what really these investment strategies are, uh, you know, in terms of returns and what they're yielding? Is, is it an issue? Like the fact that, uh, you know, 
you know, these rating methodologies may be changing uh, over time. There's no consistency, there's breaks, and that different information gets uh, incorporated that might not have been consistent with the way the past it was captured. Was that, I, I missed it. Was that question to me, Carla, or someone else? All right, I think that was a yes. Yeah, I'm just thinking like for future, yes. So for future research, as you think about these issues, if you continue to do research in this area, do you, does it trouble you um, where, where this is headed uh, in terms of like comparison over time, that is. Yeah, I, I see a challenge there and an opportunity. Uh, the challenge is you need to, as a researcher, you need to think really carefully about, okay, what exactly what information did people have at each point in time? That's where you get into concerns about, you know, did they backfill the database? That's especially important when you're thinking about, you know, is there a profitable a trading strategy here? You, to think about trading strategies, you can only use information that people had at that moment in time. That's the challenge. The opportunity is, I think there are papers to be written that exploits uh, breaks in the information environment. And suppose, uh, companies are suddenly required to um, uh, report variables X, Y, and Z. I would love to see the effects of that disclosure event. You could think of it as a natural experiment, compare before versus after that information shock. And we've seen people in other areas of economics use that kind of natural experiment to infer, like, what do people care about, right? Um, do people care about variable X? Well, let's look at what happens when suddenly variable X is reported. So I see challenges and opportunities there. Okay, and actually, uh, that I'm going to touch upon that the reporting aspect, which is um, for for those who are not very familiar with this. Um, there's been a proliferation also of voluntary and some mandatory uh, sustainability reporting uh, on a global scale. I mean more so in, in, in Europe uh, than in other jurisdictions, but there's a lot of out there. But the problem with that is um, they're very inconsistent and even for corporates to be disclosing all that data, it, it becomes costly to, or even from strategic reasons, as mentioned before, may not want to disclose. And so I think there, there are two um, developments that are coming up that may, um, maybe bring a little bit of, of, of um, you know, confluence or, or like convergence of, of what is reported. Uh, uh, one is the, the SEC, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission, is now looking at, um, by year end, perhaps uh, issues some mandatory disclosures, they're more focused on climate first by publicly traded companies, listed companies, uh, and that is consistent. And they may uh, increase that or in, enlarge that disclosure mandate later to other areas. The other one is um, uh, it's on the global arena. So this is by the I IFRS Foundation. Uh, and the I IFRS Foundation is the body that oversees the uh, I IASB, uh, International Accounting Standards Board. And, and the IASB issues uh, financial reporting standards so that then we use for purposes of research and valuation and all these other things for about 150 countries thereabouts. So that a bunch of countries around the world, US being a big exception, have adopted IFRS as, as issued or so international financial reporting standards as issued or maybe um, uh, you know adjusted to the local jurisdiction. So the big development is actually um, the IFRS Foundation is going to make a final decision by um, the November uh, 2021 uh, United Nations uh, COP26 conference on whether to create a separate board called an International Sustainability Standards Board. And their objective their, or their focus is to create um, disclosures that everyone would, or at least public registrants would would disclose with a view of their objective, they, they specifically said that disclosures would be related to uh, enterprise value. Uh, so so uh, what I was gonna ask Tim is that one, do you think there's a need to standardize data that corporations are reporting on ESG? And um, 
you know, are there areas that we clearly have, we are missing, because as you said earlier, these are very complex issues. And what are we missing that would be really important for us to start putting a little bit more um, structure around, you know, estimating long-term value for corporations, as, for example, is it because S, the social aspect, hasn't really been a concern before? And do we need things like, you know, employee turnover ratios, uh, you know, uh, racial diversity in boards, uh, things like, um, you know, median salaries, a bit more granular information between what the top echelons of a corporation earns versus others. Are there things that you feel that would be really helpful? And again, assuming that you are on the board that we need to standardize some of this data reporting um, for decision making. I, uh, thank you, Carla, for giving me that opportunity to talk about this. Um, yeah, I, I quite frankly um, get worried about um, too much standardization. Uh, if, if you look at existing financial statements, right, every single company in the United States, according to the SEC, has to have a little disclosure about their mining operations. Okay. If you look at any company's 10K, there is a sentence or two about their mining operations regardless of whether they have mining operations or not. There's a whole section of the footnotes that are designed for financial institutions to describe how they valued their marketable securities. Every single company has to report on those, even if it's totally irrelevant and nobody looks at it, right? So part of the problem with some of the proposals is that they're so comprehensive and so sweeping that, that, that no one's gonna pay any attention to them, okay? Uh, or people will just use them for political purposes and not, and investors won't care about them, right? Uh, so the question is, what is the purpose of this? Is it, is it for investors, which supposedly if the SEC and the IFRS are working towards, it, it should be focused on, or is this really have a broader political agenda that has nothing to do with investors, right? So that's one question, right? And I, and I, you know, Maybe we should separate that. Okay, here's the political stuff you have to report. Here's the stuff for investors, right? I personally don't think that all companies should report the, th the same things because different things matter. Um, recently, the, uh, the, there's a group that many of you know called the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board that is recently in the process of merging with the uh, Integrated International, Inter International Integrated Reporting Council, right? And the approach that they've taken, which I think makes a ton of sense, is to figure out what are the material things related to ESG that affect different industries. So they've set a set of standards for, for each industry based on what matters to that industry, right? And I think that's a much more use, if, if, we're, if we're talking about something that's really useful to investors, right? It's not, you know, 200 page, 200 data points on everything imaginable, right? It's what really matters to that particular industry. In oil and gas, it is the, you know, the emissions that they're generating from taking oil and gas out of the ground uh, and maybe what they're doing. If it, is, you know, if it is once again going to a beverage company, it's water consumption. What effect is that having on the environment, right? Much more useful. I can't imagine that you know, you know, if you said water consumption was one, something that everybody had to report, whether that would be useful in most cases. So I'm, I'm a little worried that about the overreach because of the sort of this mass excitement about this topic that we end up with so much reporting that it becomes actually less valuable uh, than if we just had voluntary reporting. And I'm gonna stop there, see if, see if uh, someone else has a different perspective <laughs> on that. So. Interesting, Lukas. Uh... <laughs> What's your perspective in terms of, you know, information that would be useful uh, in terms of uh, for investors that we don't already have, or maybe you think, no, we have a lot, enough information. It's just that uh, it's hard to uh, structure it in a way that makes sense. Well, so, you know, there's, there's certainly a tug of war between uh, more information is better. I agree with Tim, but you, know, but, uh, you can drown in a sea of noise because you, know, you cannot figure out you know, which parts are actually more meaningful. Uh, 
also there's uh, there's a sort of cost of uh, disclosing information, but that I wouldn't uh, necessarily. Uh, that, that, that I think could, could be actually quite quite substantial, more substantial than people people believe. There's also the issues that once uh, you uh, are very specific about the metric you need to uh, report, you know, those metrics will be managed and maybe even gamed, you know, in some in some circumstances. So so it, it's it's really it's a, the question of disclosure and uh, what disclosure should be mandated uh, is a really thorny one. It's something that uh, a lot of academics spend a lot of time investigating. There's a whole sort of subfield in accounting talking about uh, some of these issues. I mean, I, I would say that, you know, from the point of view of uh, a systematic manager like, like AQR, uh, we thrive on data. So, sort of having more data is always going to be better than, than, than having less data, you know, and it's, I think, the onus is on people like us to, to figure out which metrics are more or less relevant, you know, even in the context of the sustainability mapping, you know, but, but by the way, I mean, SESB is clearly the number one name or, you know, and uh, as we talk about the Value Reporting Foundation, you know, so I'm certain that we'll leave that conversation, but, you know, realistically, every single uh, data provider that offers ESG data, probably most managers also have their own view on the materiality map. Uh, there's also a, the fact that something is material for the company does not necessarily mean that it's useful in the investment process. It could be really important for the company, but maybe it's fully Priced in by the market, you know, so maybe that's there's no additional information you you actually uh, glean for that. So it's, it's a really complex set, set of issues. If I could sort of seamlessly, painlessly, costlessly get all that information, I I, I would opt for that. But I, I I sadly the world is I mean maybe luckily the world is quite, not quite as simple as this. The one last thing that I'll that I'll mention and um, it has to do with. Uh, uh, you know, there are uh, certain metrics that ultimately are not driven by uh, investors or the portfolio companies. They're ultimately driven by the overall society. And to the extent that I, I'm not going to proclaim that we are at this or that point in the uh, on that on the trajectory, but to the extent that you know the broader society insists that uh, companies uh, treat minorities uh, fairly, that they worry about gender equality and such, I do believe that there are some metrics that are important for the society, but may or may not be material for the underlying investors and companies. And in those circumstances, I would actually be uh, cautiously uh, Sort of pro uh, creating frameworks, thoughtful frameworks that actually will allow people to see this. I mean, in the context of of, of uh, portfolio companies, I can tell you right now, but you know, but, uh, uh, maybe thirty, maybe forty percent of companies report any data on uh, on these type of uh, metrics. And again, I understand why uh, there are really good reasons why a company may not want to report it, and I will. Uh, conjecture that it's extremely unlikely that most, most companies will report unless we have some regulation. And, you know, I, I please don't misunderstand me. I'm not going to call for regulation on, on this or any other things, but, you know, but uh, I'm just going to highlight that to the extent that society cares about these metrics, then uh, probably there's a separate channel to think through about, you know, what, what, what regulation should not should, should, should encapsulate. And, um, and, and Luke, I'm actually going to take a, a, a research spin on this about data. Are you, uh, you know, there's so much data out there. Do you use anything like machine learning, like these types of techniques and AI, like to, to try to grab this information from out there when you're doing your research? Or it's just it's a little side discussion, but I, I, I just, because there's so much information out there in different forms that I wonder how do you even you know, amalgamate this in a way that you can use it for research? Yeah, good question. I don't do uh, machine learning or, or AI on, on the ESG stuff. I think it's a good idea, and I, I would bet a lot of money that plenty of people are doing that as we speak, including at AQR, um, and maybe McKinsey, too. Um, I think it's a good idea. Uh, we... Uh, we have our hands full with the MSCI data by itself, which has, like Tim mentioned, you know, the, the 200 variables. Uh, even that is you know, more, than, more than we need for our research. What, what interests me the most is, I, I would love to see a paper or a series of papers that answers the question, what dimensions of ESG do investors care about? How much do they care about board diversity versus environmental? variables, et cetera. I, 
if you look at theories like my theory paper or Lukash's related theory, you know, we say a company has an ESG characteristic, it's one number. And in reality, um, companies have, uh, you know, 200 uh, numbers related to, to their ESG characteristics. How do investors weight those different variables? Um, I'm sure there are a thousand ESG investors out there and each investor weights them differently. But how does the average investor kind of combine all these different dimensions of ESG into a single characteristic that matters for their demand, the average investor's demand for the stock? Why that's interesting to me, interesting to me is it's, it's that average investor who matters for the ultimate stock price and hence the cost of capital. So I, I'm sure that paper is waiting to be written. I'm not going to write it, but I hope someone, maybe someone here today will. <laughs> Thank you for that. So also related to disclosures, and I, I'm, I'm going to um, ask uh, Lukas just to elaborate a little bit on that, and then I'll ask Tim, which is the, you know, a lot of the financial press has been talking about this thing called greenwashing. And uh, the issue being that just because you say that you are thinking about ESG suddenly become a target of investment. You can be called an investment that is ESG related. And so there's been a bit of a crackdown around this. And, um, but, you know, I, you know, the challenge is how do you discern this? And I, I'll start with you, Lukas. How, how do you discern this kind of like just um, marketing rhetoric to just like label yourself um, versus like trying to fundamentally find what value drivers are actually there. And yes, I have initiatives that are really trying to, you know, reduce carbon emissions or change uh, packaging from uh, plastics that are recyclable or all these other things. Because in the aggregate, if you just look at the aggregate, it just seems like just because you said that you're thinking about ESG, even if you didn't make an ESG investment, suddenly like you are labeled ESG investment. So how do we discern that? Like how, what, what kinds of things we should be thinking about? So, I mean, it's a, it's a question that is broadly belongs in uh, truth in advertising kind of uh, debate. Uh, some advertising may not be maybe somewhat misleading and, and you're right, this is a, this is a very, uh, this is an issue that uh, increasingly many stakeholders, not just investors, but also portfolio companies recognize as, as, uh, as something that is uh, worth thinking about and, and potentially uh, putting in steps to, 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 to manage. Uh, the boring answer here would be that uh, you will eventually test the company on its actions and sort of outcome variables. So if a company, I mean, you mentioned carbon emissions reductions. I mean, if a company is uh, very vocal about its stance versus you know, climate change and so on, and you know, well, eventually you will want to see that company actually deliver on what they say and you know and maybe maybe transition to the green technology maybe invest more in green r d you know and, and, and so on if you don't then with hindsight you will have known that the company was uh, at least uh, possible but potentially uh, greenwashing the, the more interesting question is that you rarely would have a privilege of doing this with hindsight you need to be able to form a view uh, on a going sort of ex ante basis uh, how would you do this you know so i maybe i'll kind of link to some of the concepts you you asked about you know earlier you know the same machine learning and such uh, you can try to uh, detect companies that uh, say a lot but but don't tell you too much. You know, you can, for example, look at the, compare the uh, information you get from company control sources versus information you get from third party sources, for example, news media coverage. You could do this uh, on a company by company basis by just reading it and using your own sort of human uh, analyst intelligence to do this, uh, to do it at scale. You, you basically you have no other way but, but rely on natural language processing, you know, for example, mapping, you know, how much in a way, correlation there is between uh, how a given um, event is viewed by the company versus how it's viewed by uh, by external sources. You, I mean, they're very, so people are creative. I'm gonna, I certainly will not, you know, sort of uh, give you the everything that is possible. I'm certain, but you know, but I, I can at best, you know, sort of tease people's curiosity and can look at the language people use, you know. So the companies that are telling 
us about how important uh, ESG, let's say, will be in the future are probably less credible than companies that tell you that uh, here's the things that we already achieved, for example. Uh, the last thing that I'll say about the uh, kind of greenwashing is um, it's, it's a little bit ironic, but you know, sometimes you might actually view this as a, as a way of signaling exposure that a company may have on a going forward basis. Companies are very smart for good reasons, I think, you know, about putting in caveats and, you know, warnings before bad news. And there's, you know, there's, there's, I'm going to limit myself to academic references here. There's at least some academic papers that show that, uh, um, uh, companies that start suddenly hedging their bets in terms of what they say or saying too much, basically talking more than they used to, are maybe sitting on bad news. And and uh, you can view this increased disclosure, even though it might seem to be very ESG friendly, for example, as being quite the opposite. The company may be sitting on bad news and just, uh, just preemptively build a defense. <laughs> That's, that, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, Tim, I wanted to, uh, I know that typically when you work with a company, you have access to, you know, their initiatives and you can really tell in terms of value creation, what they are actually saying versus doing. Uh, but if you were thinking about in terms of analyzing uh, peer groups and companies uh, that are in the same industry, how do you like try to discern something like greenwashing type statements like they're just saying that they're very concerned about ESG issues but versus they're actually uh in reality doing something about it is is there any approach you take on that um well first of all i want to just to say i agree with just everything that lukash said um and um uh th this is a difficult challenge I i'd like to like to broaden it out just to give an example of, of sort of a different form of greenwashing. About two years ago, a couple hundred companies in the business roundtable signed a statement saying, you know, we're going to focus on all stakeholders, including the environment, right? And recently some Harvard professors, I think it was Harvard professors, did a study and found that really for the most of these companies, nothing had changed, right? So companies like to make big statements, uh, that, that kind of thing. Um, but I think that, and in, in once again, building on what Lucas was saying, um, I think it's about really measuring uh, uh, what exactly they're doing, right? You know, if a company has has uh, published a you know a, a target that says we're going to be net zero carbon emissions by a certain date, you know, if they're not starting to reduce them today, they're probably behind, right? So you can you can you can benchmark. Uh, that's probably the cleanest one, right? And then a lot of companies are trying to get into, and this is something you really can't do from the outside in, right? Uh, but a lot of companies are trying, like chemical companies are trying to do things that related to the circular economy. So in other words, the plastic doesn't, uh, you know, go into landfills, but it gets recycled or they'll use other raw materials for different plastics that are that are more environmentally friendly. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work going on in these things. Um, you know, it's still early stages to see how it's going to play out. Um, one of the problems, of course, is that large companies aren't very good at innovation when it comes to radical innovation. Uh, oftentimes, the, the more radical innovations will come from smaller startup companies because the big companies have these big bureaucratic things that sort of slow down real innovation. So I think from the from from an industry perspective, I think you you can see what's going on when you talk to these companies, um, and you can measure some things like emissions. Other things I think are still at an early stage um, that it's difficult still to see who's really ahead or behind on some of these things. Great. Well, so I was going to ask each one of these the panelists to give some closing thoughts on, uh, you know, ESG and where this is headed, uh, any perspectives, because I, I wanted to thank you all for being part of this panel. Uh, some very interesting, uh, you know, discussions and more things for me to think about for sure. So, um, Tim, do you want to go ahead and, and, and give us a couple of thoughts, like, before we wrap up the session? Sure, thank you. Um, no, I think, well, first of all, I think this is an important topic. Obviously, 
the whole world is worried about this, about particularly in the environmental side and also the diversity side of things, right? And, 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 and other things. Um, I think that, you know, rather, you know, we, we shouldn't get too hung up by the little things the, you know, is the cost of capital 10, a tenth of percent higher or lower kind of thing. Um, you know, what companies might, and I, I think this, I take it more from a company point of view, because that's, that's who I work with. I think companies need to figure out what is best for them and their shareholders and their other constituents and focus on that and not worry so much about what everyone else is, is, is doing, right? I mean, that the world will be on all kinds of debates and, and, and stuff like that. In the end, you are you know better than anyone else what you can accomplish, what you should be trying to accomplish on the environmental side, what you should be doing for customers to survive and to prosper, what you should be doing as employees. I think it's really up to companies to not worry so much about um, the numbers, the ratings, but to figure out what's really going to make a difference in their company that would help both the shareholders and their and their broader constituents. Great, thanks, Tim. Lukas, do you want to go next? Sure. So I, uh, my my sort of closing remarks is, but this is not a sort of hype and a transient trend. You know, this is something that I that I strongly believe will be basically a fact of life. You know, for for the foreseeable future. Um, probably not all the investors. I'll speak. You know, more more from that perspective. Not 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 all investors, not all managers will actually incorporate ESG uh, very explicitly into our processes. But uh, I believe that uh, we are increasingly in a situation where if you don't have an ESG solution, you will basically not be able to satisfy the needs of a substantial fraction of of the uh, asset allocators of uh, asset owners out there. And I will expect that you know, but the fraction will increase. Maybe not to 100 percent, but you know, but uh, certainly more from a already a non-trivial level it's at today. And the last thing that I'll say is that, you know, ultimately, uh, at least from my perspective, I'm, I'm in a services industry. I'm, a, uh, I'm delivering uh, a product, a financial product, you know, that, is, uh, fit, that fits the needs of the underlying investors. So ultimately, whatever we think about, you know, ESG and, uh, you know, how to create portfolios, you know, what questions to ask of a portfolio companies, I mean, in a, in a way, it's ultimately up to the ultimate stakeholders, you know, so investors to, to, to be more vocal about their needs and, you know, be more uh, included in a dialogue. The one thing that I wish uh, we can be more realistic about collectively is being very transparent and very explicit about the trade-offs that these conversations often lead to. And it's difficult to have a cake and eat it, basically. But I do believe that you, know, but, uh, you can certainly improve on the utility, if you forgive me saying that, you know, that, that word with, with academic term of investors, many investors, if you do incorporate ESG in the portfolio. Thanks, Lukas. Uh, Luke, and, and I know you've given a lot of uh, good ideas to the audience of like where the future of research could be in this area, but uh, your closing thoughts on this topic. Thanks. I, I've really enjoyed this. I've learned a lot. Um, I think my closing statement is just I'm very optimistic about ESG. Uh, I'm optimistic, first of all, uh, in about ESG as a research area. I think sustainable finance is kind of where household finance was like 10 or 15 years ago. Sustainable finance, is already, it's already a very active research area, but I think it's only going to become more active and I don't see it going away. I'm also optimistic about ESG investors' um, ability to make the world a better place. I think it can happen through direct engagement with managers. I think it can happen through the cost of capital. Maybe I'm a little more optimistic than Tim about, than Tim about um, ESG investors having social impact by changing firms' cost of capital. One thing that we show in our research is that so sustainable investing can have positive social impact through the cost of capital. And it does it through in encouraging all companies to become greener because that's gonna increase their market price. And it also creates social impact by shifting economic activity, by shifting uh, real investment away from dirty firms or you know, bad firms toward, toward green firms. So I'm very optimistic about ESG. That's a wonderful way of closing this panel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the panelists uh, for taking the time and to discuss this issue. And uh, we hope to see you sometime in the future again.